you when to stop. It's the nodding heads that tell you <laughs> tell you when to stop. And so we'll try to be very much aware of that. Now, no fair. Don't just start nodding in agreement <laughs> and uh, hope to try to cut some off. First Samuel chapter 14 this morning. First Samuel or this afternoon now. And that's an also weird thing to say. Uh, your whole life you say this morning or this evening and then now you say this afternoon. So, yeah, all right. Today. Today. Amen. Uh, First Samuel chapter 14, and I want to thank you again for the opportunity to be here. Uh, I'll say this, we just had the Shives who were with you last week. We just had them for our missions conference. Uh, we've taken them on for support and uh, I love Brother Shives. actually interviewed Brother Shives years ago uh, to become, potentially to become our youth director and had a wonderful time. And we spent about three hours discussing Baptist doctrine. Just had a great time. Got all done and then I told my wife when we were getting in the car, I go, I, I mean, does it get any better than that? And she goes, only one problem. You never discuss teenagers or the youth group. <laughs> and I was like, oh, so he's a great associate type pastor and now a great pastor. Didn't have a burden for teenagers at that time. And, and, uh, but the doctrinally sound, very, very good guy. And so I encourage you for that. And then next week, the missionary family you have coming, uh, uh, going to El Paso, they'll be with us on the 18th of May. And they were just at a missions conference that I preached. And so I got to spend some time with them. And you're planning on him singing, right? I'd love if he would. I haven't talked to him. Tell him to sing. Oh, yeah, my goodness. Yeah. He can sing. He can, oh, yeah. he can, down, he can sing. He can, I'm just telling you, he can sing. And then he cheated. He cheated. I told him years ago that uh, I like to listen to music on Sunday mornings right before I go out and start greeting people. And, and uh, uh, the song, When He Speaks, uh, oh, was yeah. just... That was on loop. I had that just over and over and over again. And he was, he was, so I told him, I said, you're, you're, you're my jam right now. You're, and so then last week or last month when I preached that missions conference, he sang that at the missions conference and it was good stuff. All right. Missionaries will do a lot for support. They'll suck up a lot trying to try to get support. <clears throat> All right. First Samuel chapter 14, verse number one, let's stand and we're going to read. Uh, we're going to do the opposite is what we did this morning. All right. This morning we read a short text, preached a long sermon. This afternoon we're going to have a long text and a long sermon. <laughs> First Samuel chapter 14, verse number 1. Now it came to pass upon a day that Jonathan, the son of Saul, said unto the young man that bare his armor, Come, and let us go over to the Philistine garrison that is on the other side. But he told not his father. And Saul tarried in the uttermost part of Gibeah, under a pomegranate tree, which is in Migron. And the people that were with him were about six hundred men. And Ahiah, the son of Ahitab, Ichabod's brother, the son of Phinehas, the son of Eli, the Lord's priest in Shiloh, wearing an ephod, and the people knew not that Jonathan was gone. And between the passages by which Jonathan sought to go over unto the Philistines' garrison, there was a sharp rock on the one side and a sharp rock on the other, and the name of the one, Bozes, and the name of the other, Sina. The forefront of the one was situate northward over against Michmesh, and the other southward over against Gibeah. And Jonathan said to the young man that bare his armor, Come, and let us go over unto the, the garrison of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us, for there is no restraint to the Lord to save by many or by few. And his armor bearer said unto him, Do all that is in thine heart. Turn thee, behold, I am with thee according to thine heart. Then said Jonathan, Behold, we will pass over unto these men, and we will discover ourselves unto them. If they say thus unto us, Tarry until we come unto you. Then we will stand in our place and will not go up unto them. But if they say thus, come up unto us, then we will go up for the Lord hath delivered them into our hand and this shall be a sign unto us. And both of them discovered themselves under the garrison of the Philistines and the Philistines said, behold, the Hebrews come forth out of the holes where they had hid themselves. And the men of the garrison answered Jonathan and his armor bearer and said, come up to us and we will show you a thing. And Jonathan said unto his armor bearer, come up after me. For the Lord hath delivered them into the hand of Israel. And Jonathan climbed up upon his hand and upon his feet, <clears throat> his hands and upon his feet, and his armor bearer after him. And they fell before Jonathan, and his armor bearer slew after him. And the first slaughter which Jonathan and his armor bearer made was about twenty men, within as it were a half an acre of land, which a yoke of oxen might plow. And there was trembling in the host and in the field and among all the people. The garrisons and the spoilers, they also trembled, and the earth quaked, so that there was a great uh, uh, trembling. And the watchmen of Saul in Gibeah of Benjamin looked, and behold, the multitude melted away, and they went on, beating down one another. Then said Saul unto the people that were with him, Number now, 
and see who is gone from us. And when they had numbered, behold, Jonathan and his armor bearer were not there. Verse number one again, and we'll be done. Now it came to pass upon a day. The title of our message this morning is this. What are we waiting on? What are we waiting on? Lord, would you help us uh, this afternoon? We thank you, Lord, for the good food. Thank you for fellowship. Thank you for this church. And, uh, Lord, it's, it's worldwide impact from a mountain town in Colorado. Lord, thank you for designing missions to be something that we could all participate in. And, Lord, through it, touch eternity and every point of the globe. Lord, would you bless our time together this afternoon as we ask this morning, we ask again uh, this afternoon that, Lord, uh, you would help me to know what to say and what not to say, what to emphasize and what to just go ahead and to pass over. And I trust that you will you'll bless our time together. Lord, may it be good. May you be give a blessing to those who have been faithful this afternoon. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. All of us have things in our lives we know we need to work on. How many of you have a garage that you know needs cleaned and you've known it for over a year? How many of you have known that you need to change the oil in your car and you've known that for over a year? So I don't change the oil in my car. It leaks it out. And so then you just replace it. It's a, it's a, it's a, good, it's a good system. How many of you have ever made a promise to perhaps men, to your wife, uh, that you would take her out to a special event, a special place, a special thing, and you really mean it, you're, you're planning on it, but you haven't yet? All right, that's me. I promised my wife years ago that I would take her to a Broadway play in New York, and then COVID hit, thankfully. That's one of the best things about COVID. <laughs> couldn't, couldn't go, couldn't do that. And, and uh, how about this one? This one will, will make more application to the church here. In every church I've ever been to, there is always that one room that when you go into it, you need to tie a rope around your leg <laughs> and then enter for fear of what will fall. It is the catch-all room, the junk room. Is there a junk room? At this? I cleaned it out. You cleaned it out. Thanks for ruining this, the illustration, Pastor. That's great. There's always things in our lives that we know we need to take care of. You know, we're already aware of that. That can happen physically, but most, more significantly, it can happen spiritually. Yeah. Where we know that there's something that needs to be dealt with, but for whatever reason, we just keep putting it off, and putting it off, and putting it off. In our story this afternoon, Jonathan decides today's the day. Verse number one, it says, now it came to pass upon a day. The Bible is very specific. This isn't a unique day. It's not a special day. It's not a feast day. It's not a holiday. It's not God didn't come to him out of a burning bush. God didn't show up in the sky. He didn't receive a message, a telefax from heaven. He didn't. It just decided today is the day. Now what's going on is the nation of Israel has been surrounded for some time by the Philistine army. And of course, even from this morning, we're familiar with the Philistines and who they are. Back in chapter 13 and verse number five, it tells us a little bit about their armaments and what they're planning. The Bible says, and the Philistines gathered themselves together to fight with Israel. 30,000 chariots. Now that would be the equivalent to us of like 30,000 tanks, okay, in, in our warfare. And 6,000 horsemen. Uh, uh, up until uh, a few hundred years ago, there was not a battle won by an inferior horse army. Uh, whoever had the superior horse army always won the battles. And people as the sand which is on the seashore in multitude. So this larger superior military force has surrounded the nation of Israel. They are slowly, I liken it to a boa constrictor, just sort of restricting the movement of Israel, restricting the supply chains, and they're trying to starve them out. They are, they are encroaching little by little, and, and, and it's becoming more and more of a problem. Well, so you know how much of a disadvantage the Israelites are in chapter 13 and verse number 15. The last st statement there says about 600 men. The nation of Israel had 600 men. The Philistine army had 30,000 chariots, 6,000 horsemen, and men as the sand of the seashore in multitude. Now, if you don't know how much that is, go out and pick up a handful of sand. That, that's, that's how many thousands of people that they had. We already looked. Jonathan decides to do something about it. But I'd like to set the stage this, this afternoon for a little bit of a contrast, and then our story reveals there are two types of approaches to problems. Jonathan does something about it, 
while Saul, the king, his father, does not. Verse number two. And Saul tarried in the uttermost part of Gibeah under a pomegranate tree, which is in Migron. And the people that were with him were about 600 men. Saul, the Bible says, in the uppermost part of Gibeon, I looked up that word, and it actually means in the, in the upper uh, uh, corner, the, the furthest part away. Saul is aware, now forgive the bluntness of the statement, Saul is aware that the world is falling apart around him. We might say it this way, the world's going to hell in a handbasket around him. He's very well aware. He's not, he's not blind. He's not ignorant. He can see 30,000 chariots. He can see 6,000 horsemen. He can see people as the sand of the seashore where he has sent emissaries out to try to count how many people they are and they all come back with the same answer. There's too many to count. We can't count that high. We can't keep track of them. Saul is very much aware their goose is cooked. And while one man, Jonathan, decides to do something about it, the other man who is in charge, Saul, decides, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to get the furthest part away I can from the violence, from the enemy, and I'm going to find a pomegranate tree, and I'm going to rest underneath that pomegranate tree, and I'm going to enjoy the shade of that tree, and I'm going to enjoy the fruit of that tree, and I'm going to enjoy what little time I have left until the enemy gets us. He's perfectly aware of what's going on around him. He just is perfectly content to not do anything about it. If you're paying any attention in our world today, you don't have to pay much attention to know it's going to hell in a handbasket. The homosexual agenda, come on, yeah. being, being shoved down our throats, being, being yeah. pushed, uh, 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 CRT and, and uh, racism and, and, and bigotry and, and hate mongering and and uh, 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 just the absolute depravity of man mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. being forced on us from every side. Mm -hmm. Come on, circling us around. Right. Let me just say this. There are some who would be tempted to go, well, I'm going to flee to the furthest part away. I'm going to go to a free state. Mm. I'm going to go to Florida. <laughs> you understand that when the Philistines defeat the nation of Israel, they'll defeat the uttermost part of Gibeah under the pomegranate too? Yeah. You understand when the world comes against America and, and, and Satan and, and, and the demonic forces come against America, eventually they'll take Florida too. Mm -hmm. They'll take Tennessee too. Mm -hmm. uh, I hate to say it if you're from Texas, but they'll take Texas too. Mm -hmm. So there is one man who says, I see what's happening and I'm going to do something about it. Mm -hmm. And there is another man who sees what's happening and he's content to try to enjoy as much of his life as he can while the world goes to hell all around him. If you paid attention in this story, you know Jonathan, God gives Jonathan the victory. Jonathan and his armor bearer go out against the entire nation of Egypt, the nation of Egypt, nation of the Philistines. Uh, two men go to battle and God grants them the victory. A tremendous achievement is accomplished through the efforts of Jonathan. I'd like to look as quickly as we can. I'm hoping this will set the record for the fastest sermon I've ever preached at this church. <laughs> Hope is not a strategy, but we'll find out. <laughs> Some things that it took for this to take place. Notice now with me if you, you would in the text. First of all, it takes initiative. It takes initiative. Amen. Yeah. Now it came to pass upon a day that God arose and told Jonathan that today's the day and now's the time. Are you, are you reading with me in the Bible? Because mm -hmm. if you're reading with me in the Bible, you, you just read that that's not what it says. Now it came to pass upon a day that Jonathan, the son of Saul, said unto the young man, if the only things we do for God are pretty much when God makes us do it, yeah. we're not going to see much accomplished that's good. for the cause of Christ. Jonathan is looking out. I, I picture, I have a very vivid imagination. I picture Jonathan sort of walking back and forth and he's, he's belly aching to his armor bearer. His armor bearer is somewhere, they say, between 13 and 15 years of age. And he's like, I can't believe that, I mean, we got to do something. The Philistine army's out there and they're mocking our God and they're ridiculing our faith. And we, uh, just, I'm sick of it. And you know what? Today's the day. Let's go do it. Yeah. Nobody made it. 
Nobody forced him. Nobody yelled at him. Nobody asked him. Nobody put a gun to his back. Nobody put a sword to his back. Nobody put a spear to his back. Nobody followed up on him. Nobody, nobody, uh, 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 it's not as if the pastor was going, hey, Jonathan, have you got your assignment done? Mm-hmm. You know, most of the work for the cause of Christ is going to have to be done and will only be done when you show the initiative to do it on your own. Wow. And if you have to be held, your, your hand held and have to be begged and cajoled and, and, and can, canoodled to get to do what you already know you're supposed to do, there's going to be a big problem. There's some types of people who are content to just sit down underneath of a, uh, of a shade tree and enjoy whatever freedoms we have left and enjoy the sweetness of the fruit while we have the time. And then there are others who say, no, no, I am not, I am not accepting of what's going on in our world around us. I want to do something about it. You ever found yourself staring at the television, looking at the, we'll, we'll say, we'll, we'll broaden it, the college age young people in down in our country going. I believe the, I believe the Hebrew term is jack wagons. They're just morons. Come on, don't look at me like you're so self-righteous. You've looked at the television. You've seen people protesting uh, 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 that they ought to have their student debt canceled. Hey, it's not my decision that you took out a $100,000 loan for a gender studies degree, okay? Uh, It's not my fault that you're that dumb. And so we gripe and we complain. And then in the end, you know what we do? We turn off our TV and we go to bed and we do nothing about it. Mm. Would to God would go, you know what, I'm going to do something about that. I I don't just want to bicker and complain. I don't just want to point out the forces of evil that are surrounding this church and surrounding Florescent and surrounding Colorado. Hey, when I moved to Colorado, when I moved back to Colorado 20 years ago, we were a red state, then a purple state. Now we're a solid blue state. We're a crazy state. We really are. And instead of bickering and complaining about it, what are we doing about it? Well, what can we do about it? How about you teach a Sunday school class? How about you pick some kids up and bring them to church? How about you pay some kids way to youth camp? Come on, it got real quiet there when I started talking about things that we could do. Come on, how about we send out more missionaries around the world? How about we start more churches in America? How about we salvage more churches in America? How about instead of griping and complaining about the advancements and the encroachments of the enemy all around us, we actually showed a little bit of initiative and did something about it. Jonathan goes, I am sick and tired of what's happening. Saul says, I'm sick and tired of what's happening. Saul sits down and enjoys his freedom, enjoys his comfort, enjoys his time. Jonathan goes, I'm going to go do something, and I don't even know what it is. No, no, read the text. Come, let us go over to the garrison, the Philistine garrison that is on the other side. But he told him about his father. He had no plan. We're going to go get him. Well, what are you going to do when you get over there? I have no idea. I'm going to go do something. Number one, he showed initiative. Number two, to accomplish great victory and great things for Christ, you have to be willing to forego the excuses. To forego the excuses. Yes. There's always an excuse why today is not the day. Yeah. And now is not the time. So in our backyard, okay, if you, uh, our, we have our kitchen, our living room, our, our dining room. You step outside. We have a, a sliding glass door. You step outside in our backyard. Right there, our rain gutter has rusted and fallen down. And so it's kind of held up on the right and left side. And right there at eye level, it's drooped down. <laughs> it's been like that for... Months. <laughs> and so uh, it's pouring down rain. When it's pouring down rain, it's not stopping any rain. I mean, the rain literally is being funneled right there. Just <laughs> and my wife's like, honey, we need to fix that. Well, I know. I know we need to fix that, but it's raining. You can't, you can't go work on the, I mean, on a rain gutter in the rain. That's not safe. I mean, OSHA would have a fit. <laughs> well, then it's 75 and sunny. Oh, hey, babe, now you need to fix that. Why do I need to fix it? It's not raining. <laughs> if we want to, we can find an excuse why now is not the time for everything. Yeah. Come on. Yes, sir. Well, why, why, why now is not the time for everything? He could have said now is not the time. Our crowds diminished. Back in chapter 11 and verse number 8, the Israelite and Judah army uh, uh, to collectively had 330,000 men. 330,000. Chapter 11, verse number 8, they had 330,000 men. In chapter 13, and verse number 2, they had 3,000 men. In chapter 14 and verse 2, they have 600 men. If in case you're bad at math, they're going the wrong way. Yeah. 330,000, 3,600. I get where you could go, okay, um, 
Maybe when we had 330,000, we could do something. Maybe even when we had 3,000, we could do something. But now we don't really have very many people walking up the way do. Yeah. That's just an excuse. Yes, sir. Listen, that's just an excuse. And you say, how do you know it's an excuse? Because in verse number six, it says, it may be that the Lord will work for us, for there is no restraint with the Lord to save by many or with a few or by a few. God could, God could do tremendous things with Peakview Baptist Church in Florescent, Colorado. Yeah. If you all just decided, no more excuses, no more delays. Today's the day. Amen. The excuse of diminished crowd. The excuse of resources. This, this will blow your mind. Look at chapter 13 and verse number 22. So it came to pass in the day of battle that there was neither sword nor spear found in the hand of any of the people that were with Saul and Jonathan. But with Saul and with Jonathan, his son was there found. They're going up against 30,000 chariots, 6,000 horsemen, people as the sand as the seashore for multitude, and they have two swords. Mm -hmm. I've read stories in World War I, Russia had way more men than they had armaments and they had soldiers. And so they would assign two men to every gun. And so one man would have a gun and the other man would follow him. And they said, when your buddy gets shot, then pick up the gun and it's your gun. I'm not going to war like that. Like, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not doing that. That's not... Semper Fi and all that, but no. Give me a gun or I ain't going. Right. They had two swords. Well, pastor, I'd give to missions, but, but I'm on a fixed income. Yeah. That has to be. I want to say this respectfully because most of the time when people say that, they are, they are experienced people. I want to say this respectfully. That is one of the most simple statements that I hear in, in, in ministry. All of us are on a fixed income. Yeah. Pastor Jones doesn't just go, hey, uh, you know what? I need a little bit more money this week. So, um, church, give me a little bit more money. Because yeah, well. if he does that, let me know, and I'll candidate here myself. That'd be kind of cool. <laughs> well, you can't do that. Uh, whatever job you have, you can't just like walk in and go, hey, it's been a tight month. You know, my transmission's slipping. I need a little bit more money. Yeah. All of us are on a fixed income. Yes, sir. All of us have limited resources. Yeah. All of us could say, well, oh, well, when I have more money. You've heard the old joke, the... Farmer tells the preacher, he goes, yeah, if the Lord, the Lord will give me a good, good year with my hogs. If the Lord would give me 100 hogs, I'd give him 50. The preacher goes, really? He goes, yeah, if the Lord would give me 100 hogs, I'd give him 50. He goes, well, if he gave you 50 hogs, what would you do? Well, if he gave me 50 hogs, I'd give him 25. The preacher goes, what would you do if he gave you 10 hogs? The farmer goes, oh, preacher, you know I have 10 hogs. <laughs> exactly. I'll pause for a second so you catch the joke. Yeah, exactly. We're all more willing to give that future income that we've never gotten. You have to get over some excuses. Yeah. The excuse of a diminished crowd. The excuse of a, of a lack of resources. The excuse of a bad family example. Mm -hmm. Chapter 13 and verse number 13. And Samuel said to Saul, Thou hast done foolishly. Thou hast not kept the commandment of the Lord thy God, which he commanded thee. For now would the Lord have established thy kingdom upon Israel forever. We don't have time to preach it this morning or this afternoon, but Saul had just sinned. He had just made a sacrifice when he shouldn't. Only Samuel, only the priest could make the sacrifice in this time in history. And he violates the command of God for expediency and he makes a sacrifice. And Samuel just comes to Saul and says, because you've done this, the kingdom's going to be taken away from you and given to someone better. The someone better we know is David. That David will eventually get that. Well, who is Saul's son? Come on, pay attention with me this afternoon. Who's Saul's son? Jonathan. Jonathan. Who would have gotten the kingdom had Saul done right? Jonathan would have been the next king. Now, Jonathan had already said that he was going to uh, give the acquiesce the kingdom uh, or, or will say that he's going to give the kingdom over to David. But it would have been his had his dad just done right. Mm -hmm. It would have been his had his family been a better example. Mm -hmm. You know, your, the fact that your mom or dad did or didn't serve God is no longer an excuse as to why you can't. That's right. I'm so, I'm, I am so blessed. I have a mom and dad that are still faithfully serving the Lord, still joyfully serving the Lord, still examples for me to follow. I love them. I'm thankful for them. I had the privilege of being raised in a Christian home. I am so grateful for that. But Jonathan just goes, I'm not going to let the failures of my father, and I'm not going to let the failures of my upbringing, and I'm not going to let the failures of my nation stop me from doing what I am capable of doing. That's good. That's good. Showed initiative. Overcame excuses. Number three. He got others involved. He got others involved. Verse number one, come and let us go over to the Philistine garrison. Verse number six, and Jonathan said to the young man that bears armor, come and let us go over to the garrison of these uncircumcised. He involved other people. 
Well, you ought to be willing to stand alone. Well, sure, you ought to be willing to stand alone, but if you can get someone else to come with you, it's a lot more fun. Yeah. You know, I realize so our, our, our youth group, we have a very active youth group. We take trips every year. We do all kinds of stuff. And uh, I put a lot of effort into our youth department. And what I've realized over the years is if you don't get new kids into the youth department, the old kids get spoiled and unthankful for what's happening. Mm. Like we go to youth con in Oklahoma City. That's a great trip, fun time. And the kids will be like, we're going to youth con again. You, you know why they're like that? Because they're on grateful little pups. But anyhow, um, <laughs> because they, they've been there, done that. But you know what's fun? Is when you get some new kids that have never been to youth con, never been to a thing with 1,600 other students, and you're going to a, a water park and doing all this kind of, and they're super excited about it, that it makes the people who have done it kind of excited about it, that they're yeah. going to get to go with that person and show it to them for the first time. And I'll show you, there's this one ride, and there's this one slide, and there's this one time, and, and the boys go with the boys, and the girls go with the girls. I mean, we're just going to have a great time. It's going to be all... It's amazing how much more fun the cause of Christ can be when you get others involved. Yes. You get others involved. Well, I know who I'm going to go after. I'm going to go after the mayor. Does Florescent have a mayor? No, sir. We have a county something or another, some kind of uppity muck. Not, I, I mean, in our county, yeah. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> well, I'm going to go get them. Yeah, chances are they don't want to come. Yeah. But you could go get some 13-year-old. Yeah. Some 14-year-old. Some 15-year-old. Come on. Yes, sir. Yeah. It's the precursor to the bus ministry. <laughs> it's a bit of an exaggeration, but just... Let me do it. I like it. Next, you want to hurry. Oh, we're doing great. You want to make certain what you're doing is God's will. Well, that's good. So, Jonathan's pacing back and forth. And he's like, we've got to do something. We've got to do something. You know what? Let's go do something right now. You and me. Let's go do something. Let's just, 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 let's, let's just go do it. Let's go do it. Let's go over there and at least see what's up. And so, they get over there. Verse number six. And Jonathan said to the young man that bare his armor, Come, and let us go over to the garrison of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us, for there is no restraint with the Lord to say by many or with a few. And his armor bearer said unto him, Do all that is in thine heart. Turn thee, behold, I am with thee according to thy heart. Then said Jonathan, Behold, we will pass over unto these men, and we will discover ourselves unto them. So they get over there. They sneak out to where they're on the, the edge of the, uh, uh, of the enemy. All right, They're standing there, and Jonathan up, to, up till now has been like, We're going to go, we're going to do something. And he gets over there, and when... Uh, uh, to, to quote the Revolutionary War, uh, when you can see the whites of their eyes and you see the size of the army and it's you and a teenager and all of a sudden you just realized, oh my goodness, I just brought a teenager into a war zone. I'm risking his life as well as mine. Come on. don't. Yeah. Yeah. I remember being a father. I was excited about being a father. And then all of a sudden I realized I'm responsible for this person. Yeah. Like feeding them and supplying for them and, and helping to meet their needs and doing a, at least a decent job of turning them into a normal person. Yeah. Like not a weirdo. Yeah. I don't just, I don't, I want them to get saved. I want them to love the Lord, but I also don't want them to be weird. Yeah. Like I have to raise them not to be weird. And that's hard when you're weird. Yeah. <laughs> Jonathan gets out there and I have no doubt. He sees them and he goes, um, armor bears, like, what are we going to do? Armor bearers all excited. Yeah. Where you go, I'm going. I'm with you. Let's get this done. What are we going to do? Here's what we're going to do. I have no clue what we're going to do. Yeah. So we might want to ask God about this. Yeah. No, no, we might want to ask God about this. So he says in verse number nine, If they say thus unto us, Terry and be coming to you, then we will stand still in our place. We will not go up unto them. But if they say thus, come up unto us, then we will go up. For the Lord hath delivered them into our hand. And this shall be a sign unto us. He goes, all right, I've, I've prayed about it. I've talked to the Lord. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to stand up and let them see us. If they say, you stay there and we're going to come to you, we'll take off running because God's not in this and we're going to die. If they say, come up to us and fight us, we'll know God's in it and we'll attack them. Now, um, we'll talk about some gutsy individuals. Yeah. A man and a 15-year-old are going to attack 30,000 chariots, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. You know what he's doing? Before I do this, I want to make sure God's in it. Amen. Although a small danger, there is a danger in a missions conference that you can get excited about missions and just promise something. Yeah. Don't do that. No. Ask God, God, what do you want me to do? How do you want me to give? What, what percentage of my income would you like me to give? How would you like to provide for that? What do you want me to do? Put God to the test. Make sure it's God's will. 
Mm. Well, then lastly, and it's, it's Baptist lastly, so it's not really lastly. It's la yeah. So, verse number 12, And the men of the garrison answered Jonathan and his armor bearer and said, Come up to us and we will show you a thing. Don't tell me the Bible. King James Bible, so out of date and so hard to read. We will show you a thing. I can almost hear like they're from South Philistines. Right. They're from the South. <laughs> we will show you a thing. <laughs> I even like verse number 16. And the men looked on, and the multitude melted away, and they went on beating down one another. That sounds like it was written in 2022. I'm going to give you a beat down. <laughs> verse number 12 again. Come up to us, and we will show you a thing. And Jonathan said unto his armor bearer, Come up after me, for the Lord hath delivered them into the hand of Israel. Exactly what I was praying for. That's what they said. That's what they did. Let's go get them. Lastly, this morning, if we're going to accomplish something, there's going to come a time where you're going to have to commit. Yes. You're going to have to commit. Okay, we've, we've laid out this fleece, so to speak, and if they say come to us, then we'll know God's in it. All right, you ready? Let's, let's stand up. So they stand up. Oh, the Israelites are come up out of their holes, out of their caves. Come on over here and we'll show you a thing. Oh, now we actually have to do it. Yeah. Like, now, now. Could you imagine the fearfulness of that first step? Right? Yes, sir. Two men. Whole army. Mm -hmm. Well, it says there's only 20 people. No, there's only 20 people in a half an acre of land. You want to talk about hand-to-hand -hand close combat. This is hand-to-hand -hand close combat. And, and so they stand up, and there comes a time where they, they commit. You know something that's grossly lacking in our culture? Yeah. And it has trickled into our church culture? Commitment. Yes, sir. Well, preacher, and I don't know. I don't. I, I know some of you by name. I don't know your stories. I don't know your history. So I, I feel pretty free. I can just preach and Good. let the chips fall where they may. But we hear things like this. Man, help, preacher. I, I'm not going to join. Right. I'll come, but I'm not going to join. Yeah. Joining is just a piece of paper. Marriage is just a piece of paper. We'll live together. Marriage is just a piece of paper. No, it's a thing called commitment. Mm -hmm. Come on. It's a thing where you go, I'm all in. Yeah. It's a thing where you say, I'm tired of standing around doing nothing. I'm tired of being a Saul and griping and complaining about everything that's happening. I want to do something about what's happening. There comes a time where you've got to commit. Well, you're just wanting us to fill out a card. No, no. I'm wanting you to fill out a card, and then I'm wanting you to commit and actually follow through and do it. That's right. Because filling out a card just gets everybody's hopes up and it doesn't really change anything unless you're willing to fall through and do it. Well, I don't want to fill out a card. I just want to give for a little bit and then when the flame and the emotion goes out, stop giving. Yeah, that's right. Come on. Yeah. There comes a time where you've got to say, I'm either in this or I'm out of this. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I teach a Sunday school class, but if I teach a Sunday school class, I've got to be there every Sunday. Well, that's kind of how that works. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's how that works. There's a need to commit. You ready? Yeah. Let's go get him. Dude, you want to talk? Okay, so uh, this is horrible. This is horrible. I, I, was raised, I was raised with the great disciples of the faith. John Wayne, Clint Eastwood. Come on. I mean, just John Wayne, Clint Eastwood got nothing on Jonathan and a 15-year-old kid. Yes. And they stand up, and Jonathan's the only one that's got a sword. Yeah. And the armor bearer's like, I'm right behind you, boss. As soon as one of them dies, I, I'll take their weapon. And the first Krav Maga got started right here. Italian or uh, Israeli self-defense. Yeah. And they charge. And look, look, look what happens. Verse 14, and the first slaughter. The phrasing of the first slaughter would indicate what? There's more. There's more slaughters. This is awesome. This is starting a domino. And the first slaughter, I even love the verbiage. And the first slaughter which Jonathan and his armor made was about 20 men. You know why? In my opinion, you can disagree with me if you want. You know why they couldn't tell exactly how many men it was? Because they hacked them up so bad you couldn't tell how many people there were. It's about, looks like about 20 dead guys. We really can't tell. I mean, we started counting hands and we just... <laughs> Boom! Yeah. <laughs> so this last January, just a couple months ago, we had in our church what we call graduation missionaries. We had two different missionaries graduate. 
you know, what do you mean graduate? They went to, the, went to heaven. No, no, not quite better than that, but, but, but awesome. And that is they had churches. We supported those churches. They started churches. Those churches got to the place where they could pay the pastor, pay their own bills, do their own thing. And so they resigned support and no longer needed it. Amen. That's awesome. Yes, sir. There is a church today having services today in Washington, D.C. today in part because our church helped support them. Amen. That's not something special or specific to us. That's what missions is. Yeah. But there's a church there today. And today, they probably had 80 people or so. But today's just one service. What are they going to be in five years? What are they going to be in 10 years? What are they going to be in 20 years? And most of them are Marines that come to the service. That's extra. I mean, if you can get a Marine saved, that's worth like two in heaven. I don't know if that's spiritually accurate, but it just seems like it is. There's victory. There's victory. Next, not only was there victory. Do you think the armor bearer ever forgot? No, sir. He's 13, 14, 15. Let's say he's 15. Fast forward 70 years. He's 85. The Bible's silent. It would be great if we found out later on he became this person or that general or this whatever. He's an armor bearer. Fast forward 70 years. He's 85 years of age. I could see him sitting on his porch talking to his grandkids. There's probably nothing else that ever happened in his life that mattered as much as what he did that day. Yes, sir. And he would never forget it. Missions allows us to be a part of something that will outlast us. Yes. Reading on verse number 16, And the watchman said unto Gibeah of Benjamin, Looked, and behold, the multitude melted away, and they went on beating down one another. The enemy got not only beat, but the enemy got confused. Wouldn't it be great if the enemy, we, we, we saw some victories over the enemies in our world and in our country. Verse 17, Then said Saul unto the people that were with him, Number now and see who has gone from us. And when they had numbered, behold, Jonathan and his armor bearer was not there. Everything they had done up until this point in time, they had done secretly. They had done in private. Nobody knew about it. The vast majority of things you will do for God, no one will know about. That's right. Yes. The vast majority of things you will do for God, no one will know about. But if you'll be faithful and you'll be committed and you'll do what Jonathan did, Sooner or later, God will let it be known, even if it's not until we get to heaven. But, the Bible says, he is not, God is faithful to remember our labor of love and our works that we've done for him. Whoever gives a glass of cold water in my name shall in no wise lose his reward. God's keeping track. And sooner or later, he will reward those that have done the work in secret and in silence. I believe in heaven there's going to be a big reward for nursery workers. Yeah. And they dealt with your crying baby. Yeah. Your stinky baby. Yeah. <laughs> a couple couple weeks ago, we had a uh, a special ladies meeting in our church, and so our teenage boys came in and they worked as as waiters for this. It was supposed to be a a, a a formal affair, and so our teenage boys all dressed up and worked as the waiters for it and and whatnot. And and then we had a couple of adult men work the nursery, so the ladies wouldn't have to work the nursery. A couple of adult men work the nursery, and we're dumb. We don't have a clue what we're doing. Amen. And so. At one point, one of the men came in and kind of waved for my wife, and my wife came over, and, and he goes, um, uh, one of the kids has had an accident, and I mean, they, they, their diaper needs changed. And my wife's like, okay. Well, I don't know who their parent is. Well, I mean, you don't really know, need to know who their parent is to change the diaper. Well, I thought when something like that happened, then you went and got the parent, and the parents changed it. The guy goes, well, who, 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 who's going to change him? <laughs> he goes, I didn't know that's how it worked. <laughs> what we do in the silent, what we do in secret, the prayers we pray when no one's around, the Bible reading we read when no one's around, the money we put on the plate when nobody sees and nobody knows, it's often those things that will define us. And God has it then be put into the light. Verse number 20, and Saul and all the people that were with him assembled themselves. And Saul and all the people that were with him assembled themselves. And Saul and all the people that were with him assembled themselves. You know the guys that were content to just complain about the problem instead of doing something about the problem? Suddenly, they're willing to get engaged. Yeah. Because somebody took the lead. Mm -hmm. Somebody stepped out and committed. Somebody, somebody, somebody said, I'm going to go. So they jumped on and they started working. This is probably my favorite part. Verse 21. Moreover, the Hebrews that were with the Philistines before that time. 
Did, 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 did you catch that? The Hebrews that were with the Philistines before that time. There were deserters. There were deserters. There were people who left the Hebrew side and joined the Philistine side. Yeah. Moreover, the Hebrews that were with the Philistines before that time, which went up with them into the camp from the country round about, even they also turned to be with the Israelites that were with Saul and Jonathan. So Saul and Jonathan, or Jonathan and his armor bearer come out. They kill 20-ish guys. The hearts of the, 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 the nation of Israel, or the Philistines, melt and became as water. God lets an earthquake happen. God shakes the ground just to really freak them out. Uh, they start taking off running. And as they're running, they turn on one another and start beating down one another. And then Saul and, and his men go, what's going on? Well, they're running. Well, if they're running, we should chase them. And so they start chasing them. And then... There's Jews that are fighting with the Philistines and they're looking at the Philistines fighting each other and running and they're going, well, this, this is kind of bad. And then they see the Israelites coming and they go, this is really bad. We picked the wrong side. Yeah. And much like a lot of fans in the middle of the Super Bowl, switch teams. <laughs> hey, Israelites, come this way. Yeah, we've been waiting on you. Let's get them. <laughs> Even the verbiage. I love the verbiage. Even they... Every church, every community has some even days. Yeah. You got some people that are like, okay, that guy will never come to this church. I mean, I got, yeah. Yeah. That family will never come back to this church. You'd be surprised if you start getting some victories and God starts doing some things through you and you get committed and you decide today's the day and you get involved. You'd be surprised who God might bring back. Why should he bring them back until you're actually doing something? Wow. Wow. No real need to bring them back to sit them underneath of a pomegranate tree and cry and complain about everything that's going on. Because mm -hmm. God doesn't have this church here so you can gripe about the world around you. He has this church here so you can make a difference Amen. in the world around you. Well, we're limited. Oh, yeah, I know. Verse 23. So the Lord saved Israel that day. So Jonathan and his armor bearer saved Israel that day. No, God did it. God did it. Jonathan and his armor bearer just got to be the instrument that God used. It's awesome. You know what I really want to be? I want to be an instrument that God uses yeah. to do something that only he can do. Yeah. I, want to be a, I want to be a part of something that, that splendid, that eternal, that consequential, that, that, that matters. God makes it clear. No, no, good job, Jonathan. Good job, armor bearer. But it's the Lord that gave the victory. It's the Lord that gave the victory. Chapter 14, verse 1. Now it came to pass upon a day. Upon a day. Preacher, I've been saying for years that someday I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give to missions. Someday I'm going to really step out by faith. Upon a day. Yeah. Preacher, I know, I know I need to witness to my coworker. I've been, I need to do, I need to do that. I need, I mean, I, I, I've been, I know I, you've needed to do that for two years. Yeah. Upon a day. Pastor, I need to take more spiritual leadership in my home. I need to, I need to be the man that God, God wants me to be in my home. We've known that for a long time. Upon a day. There was nothing significant about the day except for it was the day. Jonathan said, the day is the day. That's right. I have no idea what the Lord might be working on your heart to do. None. I'm not God. I don't know. But I know this. It'll never get done if you keep saying tomorrow. That's right. Someday. Ah, someday. There have been people throughout history and even recorded in the Bible that say things like this. Go thy way for this time. When I have a convenient season. Yeah. I will call for thee. Simplified. He was saying there, I'll get saved someday. Someday a day late is an eternity too late. Yeah. Well, someday I'm going to have devotions with my family. We're going to start doing that. Someday your daughter will turn 18 and go off to college. Yeah. Help me. Someday I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get real. I'm going to get serious. I'm going to get faithful. I've known people who 
have said that for years and years and years. Yeah. So I was a youth pastor for four years before I came on staff at our church. And a young man, because of social media and whatever, I'll, I'll change his name. We'll just call him Matt. Matt got saved at, at 14 in our youth department and became an integral part of our youth department. He came to youth camp. I mean, was, was faithful to all the services and, and uh, had an older brother uh, that was a part of our youth group and, and prayed all the time for his mom and dad to be saved. At the age of 15, surrendered to, to preach and went to Heartland for a year. Ended up, when he graduated, went to Heartland for a year. In the summer, he came home from Heartland. He, he got caught up with some old crowd and some old people. And, and I, I'd go visit Matt, and I'd go talk to Matt. And this, this is what he'd say. He said, Park, I graduated a year early. I'm young. I'm only 18. I'm a, I finished my freshman year at Bible college, and I'm still only 18. And he goes, so here's my plan. He goes, I'm going to goof off until I'm 25. I'm going to live the life until I'm 25. And when I'm 25, I'm 25, I'm going to come back. 25, I'm going to get right. 25, I'm going to get serious. 25, I'll go back and finish Bible college. Or I'll, I'll, I'm 25. And he must have told me over the years, legitimately probably 50 different times, either in person or by a text, oh, I'm 25, preacher. Park, I'm 25, I'm 25, I'm 25. Matt's 38. Matt's 38. And instead of saying when I'm 25 now, he just says, someday. Yeah. Someday. Yeah. And you know what? I believe he means it. Mm -hmm. I believe he means it. Deep down in his heart. But what are you waiting on? What are you waiting on? Time's running out. And there are two kinds of people who deal with this situation. Those who can count all the problems in the world and do their very best to just stay comfortable and safe while griping about it. And then there are those who say, I'm tired of griping about it. I'm tired of pointing it out. I want to make a difference. And today is the day it starts. What are you waiting on? Good question. What are you waiting on? Yes. Today is the day. For what? To get saved? to turn in your missions card, to, to commit to go witness to that person today. Come on. Start your devotions. Whatever. Today. Don't sit around and gripe and complain about the world around you. Be the type of person who does something about it. Today. Heads bowed. Eyes closed. Heads are bowed. Eyes are closed. Lord.